Um, Emily, you start about talking about identity as kind of important. One wants to, its goal is to be cohesive, right? To be politically mobilizable, let's say. And I'm thinking, and probably speaking more from my con, my own context of research. Um, what about sort of these big umbrella groups tend to encourage subgroup formations as a way of bolstering their image of, of being capa their capaciousness to accommodate. And I wonder if that's sort of a new turn, the way we might think about big umbrella groups these days. And I'm thinking specifically, for instance, the management of ethnicities in China, but also Taiwan in the 1990s when you know the independence movement still seemed within reach. They were actually actively creating and trying to excavate indigenous groups, um, different linguistic subgroups to show that they too can have this multi-ethnic and very prolist society. So I'm wondering how that might change, um, because it strikes me that this panel, of course, is it's it, and it's very much a U.S. dominant. And the way the U.S. I think ethnic politics tend to think of itself is we take identities here very seriously. There's no sense of there's no there's no room really for thinking about let's say something like Asian American or African American as being very internally fractious. Um, that their tensions and hostility within these groups can be so high that it might not be historically any kinder than what they experience in relationship to, let's say, white race. Um, so I'm just wondering how, how you might, any of you might think about that. I mean, I think in some ways, at least to my thinking, uh, those were uh, the harbinger of what's happening here in the United States. That is, I think... What's been central, and I think the election of Barack Obama, rep, what it represents more than anything, was the crystallization of a kind of viewpoint of the United States as being able to get beyond these categories that have, you know, that created such deep fault lines at its at its at its earliest points. To sort of say, look, we can celebrate and we can elect someone who was, you know, uh, we can't quite say that, but it was the descendant of slaves. But that, in, but that the point is, is that that becomes a mantra that can get ex exported to other countries, that America is this fascinating democracy that has moved beyond these categories. Yes, there's lots of pluralism here, and there's lots of a history of racial antagonism, but in fact, we've moved beyond that. And I think in some ways, that allows it to uh, position itself in the global sphere in a particular way, right? Because it allows it to sort of say, we have dealt with the kind of final fault line that, you know, challenged our, us, our ability to be a, you know, pluralistic democracy. So in some ways, I see it as those as sort of early examples of what the United States is a, attempting to achieve or become, right? This place that sort of moves beyond these categories. Right. Well, can you, can you say a little bit more, Jing? Because I, the relationship between kind of these, you said these broader umbrella groups, and then these smaller groups. Well, even yeah, I mean, was, I'm was wondering, like, what, what was I knew what was what was particularly America-centric about? Well, because everything is so much hearing. pitted against, let's say, the dominant, you know, white race, which I can totally understand. <laughs> but the thing is, like, what about the intra subgroup? I mean, the right. relationship between the th the four of you. I mean, like, you know, let's say if we look at academic departments. I mean, why is it that we never hear an alliance between African-American studies department, Latino studies, Asian-American studies? I mean, like, what's the dynamics between those, like, more subgroups? I mean, that's sort of, I find that kind of rather interesting. I mean, is it because we're not prepared? Is it because we, we cannot afford to fracture the still vulnerable stance of minority groups at this point by talking about those interdynamics that are very destabilizing to them? Is that because, so therefore, we then present this idea of, yes, identity is about cohesiveness, you know, it's about mobilization, it's about feeling, you know, this togetherness um, as Asians, as, you know, Filipinos, as whatnot. Well, I think, and again, I'm not sure this quite gets at what you're saying, but I think that, because you can think about like, communities of color organizing together, right? But then having their separate identities. And then you can think about, and I'm gonna take the case of Asian Americans organizing together, and then there are these separate ethnic groups, right, that make it up. But to me, at least the way folks think about it in sociology in the US, um, again, these groups, 
definitely have their own identities, and I think if they didn't have their own identities, so I'm talking about subgroups that make up larger groups, I think that I think it, it would not be effective, right? That we can't just say we're one, you know, community of color and that's it. We don't see any differences between our experiences. Mm -hmm. I mean, that just wouldn't work. And so it's interesting. I, was, I just was looking at an email today um, that uh, Jerry Brown signed a bill, I think, earlier this year to, to require all state agencies that collect data on race that now they, they if they collect it on you know, whites, blacks, Asians, and Latinos, that they have to collect it on subgroups for Asian Americans, right? So they have to collect it by, and I don't know how many subgroups, they didn't read the details, but it has to be specific groups for Asians and Pacific Islanders. And, and this is definitely something that Asian American communities have been pushing for. Mm -hmm. And you might think, well, why would they do that if you know, there aren't differences? But obviously there are, there are clear differences within these groups that have to be recognized in order for the group to be able to be a cohesive whole. I don't know if that makes sense, but I think that that's the only way that these kind of broader coalitions and identities can work. So I don't know what you guys think. Well, I mean, I think the issue of within group diversity is huge, even if you're looking, I mean, I, one of the things that happens from a research perspective, because I do a lot of my research um, has to do with um, adolescents and among Latino groups. And you just think about Mexico, <laughs> how incredibly diverse it is and how you have people here who are from, you know, tiny little ranchitos and people who are from, you know, Mexico City, this huge cause. I mean, there's no, in both sort of research and also, I don't know about policy, but from, from a research point of view, the issue of sort of where people are coming from and what their indigenous status is or their class status or educational status is in their country of origin is, it's hugely complex, and then we get back to this issue of, well, what do we do? <laughs> you know, we know it. I mean, anyone who gets close understands that what's on the ground is is not categorical in any way. That there's just all these really meaningful differences, and then it sort of feels like we sort of throw up our hands and then say, well, but the data we have are survey data, and they're by category. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think in my field, there's been a lot of push. I mean, this is less a political question, but more sort of a research question. Um, I think in my field, there's been a sense, um, and Anna Maria Kause, who's now at the University of Washington, has been outspoken in psychology. Like, great, do the categorical study to show that there's the disparity or that there's a problem. But then you have to do within group studies to really understand what are the processes that are happening within, you know, say, development of Latino adolescents or Mexican-American adolescents, because I think so so much, like the work that you were talking about on the political side, so much of it has always been in relation to the dominant group as opposed to sort of a, a within-group study. So I'm not an expert on the political side, but I mean, clearly the historical context for many of these groups that are put together are, you know, that they're, they're mortal enemies on certain yeah. levels, right? So, yeah. I mean, yeah. the closer you get, the, the muddier it is. And I think we're just all in this zone of, well, what do we do? How do we deal with that complexity? And I think, I, I think there are those complexities and they do need to be empirically examined. But I think we'd also be kidding ourselves if we did not acknowledge that the differences in a range of outcomes, not just uh, economics and health, but educational opportunity, those differences are rather large between the various racialized minority groups and whites, right? Mm -hmm. That is, the differences between, say, African Americans, or even if you wanted to talk about West Indian West Indian immigrants well, and native-born <laughs> blacks, the differences, right? Yeah. Those are masked in relationship to the differences between both those two groups and native-born whites, right? So I, I think it's important to study within group heterogeneity. And at the same time, I think the reason why people focus on some of these larger ethno-racial categories is because there are profound differences between them. Now, one could argue, well, there are profound differences between those where, where I begin this presentation because we focus on those. But there's some... I, I, I would be hard-pressed to sort of think that's the case. There's some ethno-racial groups, though, whose uh, performance surpasses that of what we customarily construe as white folks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, absolutely. So, absolutely. I mean, it's pretty tricky. Yeah. yeah, but we we sort of live with these fractures in a lot of the work that we do, particularly when we're thinking about the black population, because there's 
recent immigrants from the African continent, there's West Indians, there's so-called native blacks, and this comes to a head with university admissions where in the selective institutions, a disproportionate number of the students who are getting admitted tend to be students from families of relatively recent immigration. Yeah. 